please welcome Dr. Costello Page. Great, thank you. Good morning. Hopefully you can all hear me well. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Jones. I also want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, for those of you who do not know, Dr. Jones is a longtime colleague from my time at AAMC. So glad to be back with academic medicine, with uh, members of the AAMC. I missed uh, working with our membership. Uh, so really happy to be here today. Uh, as Dr. Jones mentioned, I am the inaugural Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So I started on June 1st. And I'm, throughout this presentation, I will also share some of the uh, work that we're doing in this space uh, so that possibly we can think about how we might collaborate and partner on some of these initiatives. So I'm planning for some interactive portions throughout this session. So if you're able to do so, please feel free to turn on your camera. Uh, please feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, there'll be opportunities for you to unmute and speak. I'm hoping that uh, to have uh, participation from all of you uh, to make the uh, session a little more interesting and fun this morning. So thank you. So here are objectives for today. Um, I will introduce uh, the notion of inclusive leadership and share some resources with you so that you can continue your development in this area since we only have one hour uh, today. And I'm gonna try to accomplish these three goals. Uh, first, uh, to discuss the value and importance of an inclusive culture and its connection to diversity, equity, and anti-racism. So we'll spend some time understanding these concepts and how, how they're connected. Uh, number two, to gain skills to become a more inclusive leader. Again, this is just an hour session, so I'm going to leave you with some really good resources to help you continue your work in this journey. And also to begin to develop a workplace vision that supports an inclusive culture. So we'll have uh, some opportunity towards the end to do uh, an activity to begin to think about this. Again, just a few minutes, we won't have a whole lot of time. But before I get started, I do want to share that leadership applies to all of us, regardless of, regardless of our title, right? Uh, so I do not define leadership in the traditional or hierarchical sense. We are all leaders, uh, and, and this applies to all of us. And so just keep that in mind, that leadership is not just certain folks that we might perceive in certain positions. It really does apply to all of us. But before I get started, here's our first opportunity for you to share, um, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, but when you think about what would a truly inclusive organization look like, what comes to mind? You know, what would you envision? What would that look like? What would you hope to see? Uh, and please feel free to either unmute and speak or even share your thoughts in the chat um, if you can. So we'd like to really get your thoughts to see your thinking in terms of what inclusion looks like uh, from your perspective. So would anyone like to share? Let me see if I can move the chat feature so I can see as well. Oh, go ahead. I, I heard a mic unmute. Hey, this is Kyle Brothers. I was just thinking um, inclusion has to include uh, listening. So I think an organization that's inclusive would um, have, um, you know, a shared decision making model and involve uh, all different kinds of folks in the organization uh, in uh, hearing out their opinions on making decisions. That's great. The, the listening piece. I'm glad you highlighted that. And that is absolutely right. Uh, I see here in the chat, uh, someone stated, everyone feels valued regardless of role or status. Absolutely, right? And, and that's sometimes difficult, right? In, in very hierarchical elitist type institutions, which higher ed overall <laughs> tends to be in, in many of the institutions that we work in. So absolutely. Any other thoughts? What does this mean to you? And, and what would you envision? What would you like to see? I see here in the chat, we are imagining every I, i'm assuming you mean everyone at equal status with equal voice on matters wonderful thank you for sharing that any other thoughts on this I, I think that everybody needs to realize they have the opportunity to be contributors and heard uh not just that they have uh, the, the right to but they feel free to 
Yeah, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that, right? Yeah, we certainly want folks to feel that this is part of them, right? And part of the work that they do and feel that they can contribute. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna come back to this. So keep these ideas in mind because this is going to be some of the work that we're going to do towards the end. This is going to be really helpful. So thank you for sharing uh, those initial thoughts. So our first learning objective is to discuss the value and importance of an inclusive culture and its connection to diversity, equity, and anti-racism. So let me share some key definitions first and, and talk about how they're connected to get us started here. What I'm sharing here, uh, this is from our uh, NRC, which is um, part of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And this is our strategic plan from uh, 20, uh, 2021. And so this is our definition for diversity, which is pretty standard, right? Uh, most definitions look like this. And when you look at these definitions, you see that they're pretty much a list, right, of different aspects of diversity, right? Uh, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. So it's essentially about difference, right? But it's when we tie it to inclusion, and you look at this definition for inclusion and you begin to see that inclusion is about leveraging that diverse talent, right? Really putting that diversity to use. And you may have heard a, a popular quote now, diversity is being invited to the party while inclusion is being invited to dance. So without that inclusion, we just have diversity and we really don't get to the benefits of having that diversity unless we have <clears throat> that inclusive culture. Equity is also part of the equation, right, as it contributes to inclusion. And it's essentially about the norms, the policies that are in place that ensure that everyone has access to opportunities, right? So some of you, when you were envisioning inclusion, you talked about some components of equity. Equity requires uh, preliminary work, right, to identify the imbalances, the loopholes, the unequal starting places. So there's some work we have to do to understand equity. But the point here is that all three are necessary, all three are connected, and all three lead us to institutional excellence. So there's this interdependent relationship with these three concepts. Let me look a little bit closely at inclusion here. Um, and so this is the definition you see here on the left uh, from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, right? And they give us a general de definition of inclusion, which is an environment where everyone is treated with dignity and respect, where the talents and skills of different groups are valued and where pro productivity and customer service improves because the workforce is happier, more motivated, and more aware of the benefits that inclusion can bring. So it's a really general definition, but I really like this piece uh, written by the editor uh, from the Academic Medicine Journal uh, in May of 2020. And so it's a wonderful piece and I'll have it in my list of resources for you uh, to take a look at this piece more closely. And in this piece, uh, she further, the editor further talks about belonging, right? Because belonging is also part of inclusion. And, and some of you also mentioned belonging when you talked about your vision for an inclusive culture. Belonging is simply the experience of being accepted, included, and valued by others, right? And belonging is the interpretation of cues that suggest that we fit and that we're welcome. Unfortunately, we know that many isms, uh, discrimination, racism, sexism, and other exclusionary practices hinder belonging and actually lead to isolation, diminished trust in the organization and effectiveness, um, emotional distress, health issues, right, uh, and impact overall well-being. Also, we know that the lack of inclusion within our organization can also diminish innovation, and the development of new ideas and practices, which is not what we want in academic medicine for sure. I love this quote uh, because it really hones in on the importance of connecting diversity and inclusion, for example. And so if we look at this quote closely, it states, diversity of representation and a culture of inclusion must be intertwined and inextricably linked. Diverse representation without a culture of inclusion spells disaster, while an inclusive culture without diverse representation lacks credibility. And so I share this with you because oftentimes, and especially during my times at AAMC and working with our member institutions, I would see institutions that 
primarily focus on diversity, on, on the, the, the numbers. But without an equally important focus on inclusion, we don't see progress necessarily, right? And so people may leave the organization, so we have this revolving door issue. We may even see more chaos. So again, all three, even though this quote only connects inclusion and um, diversity, inclusion, equity, and diversity are all important uh, for us to be successful. This is just one slide to get at sort of the benefits of an in inclusion, excellence, and, and diversity as well. Um, we, we have over 40 years of social science research that shows us that diversity leads to more innovation and creativity, and that diverse teams uh, outperform homogeneous ones, especially when it comes to solving complex problems, right? And when we think about the work that is done in academic medicine, that's precisely it, right? You are solving complex problems, right? Inclusion also leads to uh, all of the items that you see listed here. Um, enhanced employee morale, increased productivity, improved job satisfaction, enhanced morale, et cetera, et cetera. So again, all of these are components that are all necessary for thriving workplace culture. We also know that inclusion leads to increased innovation, and that when we have environments where there's this perceived pro-diversity environment by managers and employees, it has a significant positive effect on key business indicators. And that it also leads to less biased decision making. So there's a lot of evidence, uh, like I said, just even in the, just in the social science arena, and of course in many other arenas as well, uh, looking at the benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Specifically in, in the health professions, right, uh, this is a, a field where diversity and inclusion has been prioritized for, for a very long time now. Our health profession schools and other organizations have been working hard for many years uh, to increase the, the number of diverse students and faculty and residents, right? Because we know that the research tells us, right, that the learning, uh, learning in a diverse environment leads to better learning for all students that diversity in health professions uh, and health professions workforce also increases access to high quality healthcare services, right? So it's essential if we're going to uh, address health equity. Uh, we also know that medical research will grow and is improved when diverse teams are confronting those, those challenging problems. And that it's essential to have a healthcare, healthcare providers that understand um, and are culturally comp understand culturally competent practices, right? So they can provide the best care possible. And, but overall, again, that diversity, equity, and inclusion supports institutional excellence, right? By making our medical schools, our teaching hospitals, and other health profession schools better places to learn, to teach, to work, and, and to provide care. So there's a lot of evidence, um, and I have to tell you, in working with now science and engineering, in addition to medicine, there's been a lot more uh, work that has been done in this space when it comes to, to medicine and, and the health professions overall than the other two fields. I also want to talk about um, uh, systemic racism, right? Um, because diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. But during the past two years in particular, we have seen a nationwide call to action, especially in the health sector, to once and for all address systemic racism, right? And to begin to truly combat these health inequities, right? Inclusive leadership is going to be key, right? If we're truly going to be successful, right, in addressing these systemic issues. So this is why I think this is important that we also spend some time talking about uh, uh, racism and in particular systemic racism. So let me share what, what um, some organizations have done that are in this, in, in this uh, in the health sector. Uh, so the American Medical Association, which I'm sure many of you know, one of the largest professional associations of, phys of physicians, uh, developed this comprehensive uh, strategy for embedding racial and social justice within the organization and work. And so what they've done, if you have an opportunity to look at their work, is uh, they've craft crafted a very detailed and bold approach, right, wherein they recognize the harmful effects of AMA's past. So a lot of organizations are really looking at their history and thinking about how they've contributed in the past uh, to these inequities. And so, for example, in their work, uh, you would see how they're embedding racial justice throughout the AMA. 
Um, they're building the necessary alliances and, and, and thinking about sharing power with historically marginalized positions, right? Um, they're pushing to address social determinants of health and root causes of inequities, right? Uh, so there's a lot of really, um, uh, really wonderful uh, uh, areas that they're tackling, right, that need to be tackled um, in, in their plan uh, that they've laid out here. And also recently you may have seen that the AMA and the AAMC also launched a new guide for language and other concepts, right, to understand advanced health equity. So if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that guide, and I'm happy to share those resources with you if you haven't had a chance to see them. CDC has also reaffirmed their commitment to addressing racism and advancing health equity. Um, and so they have established a racism and health equity uh, health web portal uh, to highlight the negative role of racism and what it, how it plays um, the negative role racism plays on health, but also to present some solutions right. And so they do a really good job in connecting racism to the social determinants of health and also to health inequity. So another wonderful resource to take a look at. AMC has also done some work in the space. Um, and so what you see here is a framework that they um, developed that outlines concrete steps to address st structural racism, right, on all fronts at the individual level, right, because we all have work to do in the space as individuals, as an association, what they're doing as part of the larger academic medicine community and also as part of even a broader community than that. So, a really good framework to also look at um, and to think about how this may, may apply to you as an organization as well. And then also wanted to share specifically what medical education senior leaders have done uh, th through their work with AAMC, uh, where they created this report to help guide other leaders on actions that they can take to dismantle racism in medical education. And here specifically, they tackle racism in the learning environment, right, and the curriculum uh, in medical education. So for, for those who are really interested in medical education specifically, they provide some really good guidance here as well. And lastly, uh, this is a report by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, right, where um, they are also interested in advancing racial equity and inclusion. And they recognize that this work can seem daunting for many of us and often leaves us wondering, how do I even begin this work? Where do I start? How do I take a DI lens to the work that I do and address these issues? And so in this report, they provide uh, seven steps, right, to begin to understand and incorporate race equity and inclusion, right? So they walk you through engaging the affected stakeholders, gathering the data, understanding the root causes, identifying strategy. So they take you through these seven steps uh, to help you do this work. So a lot more guidance um, is coming out now, uh, giving guidance to folks because there's an interest in doing this work, but there's often uh, some challenges in understanding you know, sort of where to start and, and how to go about doing this work. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of these initiatives because there are many more out there. Just wanted to highlight uh, some of these prominent ones. Also want to share what we're doing at the National Academies. Um, and so this is a framework that I've, I'm applying um, as I've joined the organization and I'm beginning to do this work. And so what I like about this framework uh, around inclusion, it presents inclusion on this continuum. And there are other, con other frameworks that do this. But this one in particular brings in these anti-racism principles, right? And so this is an example of a framework that could help guide your work as well um, at your organization. And so um, as I begin, um, my office begins to engage with our staff, our members, our volunteers throughout the organization, we are get, gaining insights in terms of where we might be as an organization currently, and then some developing strategies uh, to move towards the right of this model. So this is a really wonderful model. Again, has been um, many other institutions in um, academic medicine are also using this model to guide their work. Okay, so I've provided some background on key concepts, uh, some of the research, right, on diversity, equity, and inclusion, the development uh, um, 
and, and development in this field. Um, but now I want to shift gears here and specifically discuss inclusive le leadership and also want to share some additional resources with you um, that you can reference as you continue your own development in this area. So the second learning objectives is to gain skills to become a more inclusive leader. So let's, let's start here. And so we've defined inclusion, we've discussed why it's important and how it connects to these other concepts like diversity, equity, and anti-racism. But let's move to discussing the skills necessary to become a more inclusive leader. I think by now you understand why understanding those issues is important uh, to us as leaders in, in doing this work. And if you've done other leadership uh, development trainings, for example, in the past, you may notice as you look at this model that inclusive leadership is found in other uh, types of leadership development, right? In transformational, servant, authentic leadership, for example. So it's not necessarily new, right? But what I like about this model that was developed by Deloitte is that it's based on studies with over 1,000 world leaders, right? So this model entails what you see listed here, treating people in groups fairly, right? Personalizing individuals, right? Understanding and valuing their uniqueness and leveraging the thinking of diverse groups for smarter ideation and decision making. So uh, some of these you mentioned in the beginning when you talked about your vision for an inclusive culture. And some of this, that, that third bullet really gets at those benefits of having a diverse and inclusive workplace culture, for example. And so according to this work by Deloitte um, and in this model, highly inclusive leaders demonstrate these six signature traits. And so let's walk through each of these. So starting with the bottom left of the model, the first trait you see is commitment. And so what they found was that highly inclusive leaders are committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, not just because it aligns with their personal values, right? but also because they believe in the business case, right? There's this uh, level of authenticity, right? In terms of their commitment to this work. So it's not just to check the box, not just because I have to do this or someone's telling me it's the right thing to do, but I personally believe it and I also understand the business case. So that's why understanding the evidence around uh, DEI is important because that's, that's part of uh, being an inclusive leader and understanding this space well. The second area they highlight is courage, right? And they found that highly inclusive leaders speak up and challenge the status quo, right? They take risks in doing so too, right? And so they don't just talk about it, right? They don't just say the right things in speeches or uh, when they're engaging colleagues and staff, but they also take action. And oftentimes we don't see that right we see folks who talk a good talk right but the actions don't necessarily align with what is they're saying but in truly uh highly inclusive leaders both are connected they take action and they can also uh, talk about these issues and and take a stance on these issues the third area um you see highlighted in this model is cognizance of bias right and so they found that highly inclusive leaders are mindful of personal and organizational blind spots, right? And they self-regulate and work to mitigate these biases continuously, right? We all have to do this work. I, I do work around unconscious bias as well, and I often catch myself, right? Uh, so this is ongoing work in ourselves and within our organizations, right? Uh, to continue to uh, develop in this area and, and to do better, right? So we know that there's work we have to do individually, but there's also work we have to do in our systems, right? In our processes, in our policies, because bias can oftentimes be embedded um, in, in those practices as well. So again, individual work, but also uh, system-wide level work. And then the fourth area they highlight is curiosity. And this refers uh, uh, to having an open mind, right? An open mindset and a desire to understand how others view and experience the world, right? And so it also requires, when you think about it, a tolerance for ambiguity, right? So this curiosity to ask, to understand, to put yourselves in others in other shoes, right? To understand their perspective and, and to this desire, I think someone mentioned earlier, to listen, right? Not just to listen, but to listen and learn, right? The fifth area they highlight is cultural intelligence. 
And so this refers to being confident and effective in cross-cultural interaction, interactions, right? And understanding that not everyone sees it the way we do, right? And so this applies to all of us, right? Some of us do not have this skill more so than others, right? We all have to continue to develop our cultural intelligence and an understanding of others and how best to communicate and interact, right? And then the last area they highlight is collaboration. And so this refers to empowering individuals as well as creating and leveraging the thinking of diverse groups, right? That's that putting that diverse talent to use, right? Not just for symbolic purposes, right? Not just to check the box, but really because you value and you recognize the importance of that input and, and of collaboration, right? Uh, we know that in uh, successful organizations, collaboration is key, right? We, we can't do the work that we do effectively if we're just kind of on our own, right? We have to work with one another. So really like this model and these six C's, um, and you, I'm sure you can see that, you know, with all of these areas, there's this continuation, right, of learning and growing, and because we're not all going to be great in all six areas, right? We, we have to continuously you know, work on these. So let me um, share this other work by um, Jennifer Brown here um, and build upon the, this model with the six C's, commitment, courage, cognizance, curiosity, cultural intelligence, and collaboration, right? As I mentioned, we all have different strengths, right? And areas we, and, and, and areas we can improve upon, right? When it comes to these different C's and how they play a role and how we lead, right? So it makes sense that we would be stronger in some of these versus others. So what I like about Jennifer Brown's work, uh, How to Be an Inclusive Leader, is that she talks about these four phases that I think are really helpful for us as we embark on this journey towards becoming a more inclusive leader, right? And so the first phase uh, that she presents is unaware, right? And this is when we maybe see diversity is only about compliance, right? Or maybe just an HR function and it should just sit over there or maybe in the diversity office. It has nothing to do with the work that I do. It's someone else's job. And we're often, when we're in this unaware stage, uh, we are unaware of that bias plays a role in our decision making, even if we don't intend for it to. Uh, that, the, that racism and other isms, right, are embedded in the systems that we work in. And so there's this unawareness, right, or, or just a, that has nothing to do with me, that sits over there, right? But as we enter phase two, right, um, she talks about uh, beginning to educate ourselves, right? And this is when we begin to understand maybe the privilege that we have as leaders, right? We all hold privilege, right? Some more than others and some in different uh, areas. But as leaders, we are all hold a certain level of privilege, right? And so we begin to recognize that the privilege that we have in our organization, also in society. And we also begin to question our contributions, right? To maintaining those inequities. Wow, I'm contributing to that. And I don't, I wouldn't want to do that. Why? How, why is it that I'm doing that, right? And we also begin to understand intersectionality in others, right? We begin to see that as humans, we're complicated, right? It's not just putting a person in a box and that's all they are, but we begin to see things can be different for other people based on different aspects of their diversity, for example. So at this stage, we're starting to get, to build our knowledge and awareness of these issues, right? And, and the contributions that we could be making um, without wanting to do so, right? Phase three, she talks about um, what she calls the active stage. And here you have shifted your priorities, right? You are starting to have a voice. You're beginning to take meaningful action in supporting others. So maybe you're mentoring others, right, that you see have been maybe left out or has, haven't been fully included, right, in the workplace culture. And maybe you're even taking a step further and you're sponsoring folks, right? You're taking a more active stance and supporting these individuals and standing up for them, right, in, in areas where you may have power, right? You may have more power than others, right? But we're still focused at the individual level, right? And there's this um, 
concept of I'm going to change things one person at a time, right? I'm going to mentor people, sponsor them. I'm going to do the best that I can one person at a time, right? When you get to the advocate stage, that's when you're doing more systems thinking, right? So here you're proactively and consistently confronting these isms, right? And you're working to bring about systemic change. So you're looking at the policies and the practices and the procedures, right? From this equity-minded anti-racism lens, for example, right? And so overall at this stage, you are applying an equity-minded lens to address structural inequity, maybe institutionalized racism, you know, and other exclusionary uh, practices that have been part of our organizations and of our field, right? In academic medicine for decades, right? So again, this is ongoing work we have to do as leaders regarding these six C's um, that, that I've shared with you here today, um, just like we do with many other aspects of our jobs, right? We don't just stop learning and growing and developing, right? We continuously grow and develop in our fields. And so I, what I like about um, uh, uh, Dr. Brown's work here is that it gives us a sense of where we might be regarding these different elements of inclusive leadership and how we can move towards the active and advocate um, phase of this work. So I want to share resources now before the end because oftentimes we leave this slide for the end and then we never have an opportunity to talk about it. Um, but I think this is these seven resources you see here would be really helpful to you um, as you continue this work. Um, so the the ones in the box, those three um, uh, resources you see listed there are the ones that I've shared with you today in, in, in developing this work. Um, so the, the article by uh, Roberts, the uh, Academic Medicine Journal, um, from uh, the editor from that journal, um, which talks about belonging and inclusion in medical education. So I think that's a wonderful resource. And then the work by Deloitte with the six C's. Uh, so that's the reference for that. Um, and then of course the work by Jennifer Brown on how to be an inclusive leader that shares those different stages. So I think those three resources are, are really wonderful. And I recommend that you further look at them. Um, the other piece that Jennifer Brown's work, um, uh, when you purchase her book, and I think actually you can just go to her site and do this, um, she has a, an assessment link uh, that can help you uh, assess how, how inclusive your leadership style is. So if you go to her site, you Google it, you'd be able to do that assessment, um, I think even without purchasing her book. And then I wanted to share the additional resources you see listed there. Even though I don't specifically highlight them, they're all really helpful. Um, so the McNair and Bensimon book really talks about being an equity-minded leader, right, thinker. How do you take that DI lens in, in all that you do? So I think they do a wonderful job in capturing that. Of course, I have to share uh, Dr. Kennedy's book uh, on how to become an anti-racist. Uh, this book obviously became quite popular in the last couple of years as uh, many organizations and as individuals, um, we, were, we were struggling, right, and trying to understand what was happening in the world. And then also the work by Donovan and Kaplan. Uh, I think it's a wonderful resource that gets at what's inclusion and why it matters. It really most mostly based on the business literature, but I think it's applicable uh, to us in academic medicine as well. And then the last resource there by Edmondson uh, covers innovation and how it can grow when people feel safe, right? And when they feel they can contribute and speak up. So she talks about that psychological safety that is necessary for us to do the best work. So again, collectively, these seven resources could be really helpful to you in this journey as you, as you strive to become a more inclusive leader. So just want to share those, and I'll bring them back up at the end as well. Okay, so now I want us to uh, take the last uh, minutes that we have together to begin to develop a workplace vision that supports an inclusive culture. So we'll do an activity, and fortunately, we're not going to break up into small groups. So if you are already in a group setting, this will work out nicely. You'll take a few minutes to kind of think about the questions that I will pose. Um, and then I'd like for you to share uh, with us, um, maybe not all three, there are three questions, but maybe some of the discussion you may have had. Um, and if you're working, um, you're alone in your office or in your home office, um, or 
the hospital or medical school, you know, feel free to also uh, participate in this activity by looking at these questions and, and applying them to yourself. And I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, before I do that, I want to share um, our vision at the National Academies for an inclusive workplace culture. And so I'll leave you with this slide and then we'll go to the activity. So um, as I began this journey in, in this organization, you know, the question I would often get, what would success look like and uh, what, what would it look like for us? So th these are the four areas, right, that, um, hi, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I, can I thought hear I heard you. someone. Okay. Yeah, we can hear yes, you. Yes, can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so here are the four areas that um, we we want to accomplish right at, at the National Academies. Uh, one, uh, to foster a, a diverse and inclusive workplace culture where everyone feels welcome, valued, respected, a sense of belonging, and can ultimately thrive, right? If we can't do our work, then that we're not going to be effective. And so this first item, it's about people's lived experiences, right? It's essentially that we prioritize creating a safe, equitable, diverse, inclusive workplace environment, right? Where everyone can, can experience this. So it's about the people. But as I've been mentioning, it's also about the practices and the systems, right? And so that's the second bullet you see there is to create practices, procedures, and policies that are inclusive, equitable, anti-racist and as bias free as possible, right? So we're spending time critically examining those practices, those policies, those procedures to ensure that um, they, they, uh, they can be as bias free and, and inclusive as possible, for example. And then the third area that's important to us is the work that we do, right? And to advance a workplace culture that applies a DI lens to all that it does, right? That em while also embracing uh, that diverse constituency, which are members in our volunteers, so that in all of our consensus studies, in all of our workshops, we apply this DI lens so that we can produce uh, the guidance and the resources necessary for this nation, right, in the work that we do. And I think if we're successful in those three areas, we could potentially achieve national recognition, right, as an organization that utilizes DEI as one strategy, one mechanism to execute on its mission, right? So again, this is what we're envisioning. Um, and the first two items in particular connect to our vision of an inclusive culture and, again, has implications for our leadership and, and how we do this work within our organization. So I will stop talking there. Um, this is now the opportunity for you to do some work and for all of us to hear uh, from one another. And so what I'd like to ask you to do is to begin thinking about this action plan for inclusion. We won't have a lot of time today to fully do this, but I think we can start if you start by thinking about the six C's that I've shared, right? The commitment, the courage, the cognizance, curiosity, cultural intelligence, and collaboration, right? and thinking about your ongoing education and growth in these areas, right? Whether you are closer to the aware or maybe you're more in the advocate, uh, already in the advocate stage, right? How can you even take this further and how can you bring others with you, right? So first, think about creating a vision for the inclusionary leader you aspire to be, right? So what, you know, what does that look like for you? Right. Um, where can you improve upon? What is that vision for you, for yourself? Right. Um, when it comes to where and, and again, Jennifer Brown's assessment will help you with that. But as you think about areas of opportunities and growth for you in this space, think about that. And then number two, uh, develop a vision for an inclusive culture at your institution. What do you want to see? Right. We began today by discussing um, this with some of you. You shared sort of what you'd like to see within your own, own organization. But think a little bit further about that. Right. What's your vision for your organization? And maybe you sit in the medical school and, or in other health profession schools at the hospital. But, you know, you may want to just start by thinking about your primary organization where you primarily spend your time. What would that look like for you? What would you like to see? And then the third, you know, begin to identify specific actions, right, that you can take to move this vision forward for yourself as leaders, right, but also what can you do 
to for for improving the culture within your organization uh, towards being more inclusive, right? So those are the three questions. So I, you know, let's take maybe five minutes or so. I know it's not a whole lot of time um, for you to think about these, and then we'll come back. And I'd like for some of you to share um, your thoughts and your ideas regarding these three questions. Any questions? Does that make sense? Let me see if I can see the chat now. Okay, so we will take five minutes. Uh, it's 8.41, so I'll come back at 8.46. All right, we have one more minute. All right, so I officially have 846 here on my uh, on my laptop. So we'll go ahead and get started uh, since I know five minutes can seem like a long time uh, in a virtual setting. So 
please feel free to share. You can unmute and share your thoughts. Uh, you probably didn't have the opportunity to tackle all three. Uh, maybe you tackled what you uh, envisioned for yourself and as, as an inclusionary leader, or maybe what you were a deeper development or thinking about an inclusive culture here at your institution. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to unmute, or you can also enter um, uh, your response in a chat as well. So with that being too uh, diverse in this with my thoughts, uh, one of the things that I see is, well, one, I sort of question why we use the term teach as opposed to share and develop ideas with other learners. Uh, I understand institutionally because of our contracts and just institutional traditions, we have these levels of professor, associate professor, assistant professor, instructor, and student, but in basically we're, we're all learners and uh, we can all learn from each other rather than having the designation as being a teacher. We can, you know, set examples, we can share examples and learn from each other. Uh, so the, the more we can get away from that hierarchical uh, nomenclature of what quote level we're at, uh, I think would be a, a major advantage for changing our culture. And with that uh, change of culture would also be the opportunity to spend more time demonstrating to our uh, less experienced learners that uh, we can take the time in a patient interaction to uh, demonstrate the interest in learning more from our patients who may come from different backgrounds or have different uh, economic values or uh, cultural values that we can learn from them. and. Uh, by demonstrating that we want to learn from them how we can improve what we do. Thank you. I, I really like that. And especially because you, it, how you teach, right, or how you, um, what you, or at least what I picked up, also sends a signal, right, in terms of, uh, so our approach, not just the content, but how we approach it, right, and how we're all learners, right? You're right. We're all learning, right? These are I may work in the space, there's a lot that I still have to learn and to uh, work on uh, so that I can continue to improve in this area as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I see here also in the chat, um, someone stated a few specific items our residency program has been thinking about working on, visiting rotations specifically for students from more diverse backgrounds, celebrations for non-Christian holidays and events, right? Pride Month, Black History Month, et cetera, in-depth anti-racism audits of our noon conference uh, didactic curriculum. So a lot of areas that you've highlighted there, right? Some around diversity, right? And bringing diverse perspectives and ideas to the table, um, recognition of the importance of these events, right? And, and other areas related to diversity, but also thinking about, right, the processes that you have in place, right? So thank you for sharing that. Hi, this well, is Go ahead. This is Dr. Terrio. I was just wanting to um, comment more on what Dr. Schickler had put out there because I think in um, being more intentional with um, learning, um, you're learning yourself. And I, and I think you, if you think you've known everything, you can't learn anything. And so I think, in, you know, this, this, especially the six C's, it starts from within and you have to be um, aware that um, you're not always right and aware that um, you need to learn and that you have biases. And I, and I think that's a daily thing. And, um, and people who think they don't have biases really, you know, that that's a problem. They're not going to learn. And so, I, and I don't know how to um, approach that, but I think before you can be an inclusionary leader, or have an inclusive culture, you, you kind of need to change the, the mindset of the people within that, that group. Yeah, no, that's a great point. You're right. You know, oftentimes, right, um, it's especially if, you, if you've participated in some type of bias training, right, that's typically where you start, right, in really making the case that we all have bias because it's human nature. And it's less about whether we intend or not uh, to, to do harm, Right. But I think once we we recognize we have that bias, we can begin to implement strategies in ourselves to mitigate that bias. Right. Um, but that's ongoing work. Right. Um, 
it's, it's, and it's human nature, right? If we didn't have bias, we wouldn't survive, right? It, it helps us make decisions, right? Um, in an instant uh, to be able to, uh, to survive as human beings. Unfortunately, some of our biases can hinder, right? Um, others and, and can have a, an opposite effect of what we may be intending. So that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. What about others? What are your thoughts and, and what, what are you thinking in this space and um, whether it be about the culture and, and what you could do and how, how we can all contribute or what some work that you might have to do as, as a leader? And you can also enter it in the chat if you feel more comfortable or you can unmute and speak. So I see a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, so I just wanted to contribute really quickly. Um, in terms of like creating an inclusive culture, something that we did um, earlier last year after the Breonna Taylor ruling came out, um, we, instead of having a morning report, we really just took the time to create a, a safe space to talk about how we felt and how we were affected by it. And for me as a black female that moved here right after that happened, I got to give my perspective, which was very different from a lot of people here who don't have my background and haven't had the same experiences. So I think it's really important to create that kind of culture. Absolutely. Right. I, I, and I think a lot of, a lot of organizations, right. Um, where trying to understand what was happening and trying to figure out how to even have a dialogue around these issues and, and some, you know, in some areas we were more effective in talking about it. In other areas, it was a, was a little bit of a disaster, right? In terms of not knowing what you were walking into, right? That um, there were some really strong emotions, of course, around all of these issues. So um, that's really important, and that's some of the work we're also in terms of our inclusive culture at the academies. One of the areas that we're proposing is creating those safe spaces for dialogue, right? Because parts of the organization did have an opportunity to talk about this and were more inclined to do so and more experienced to do so, but there were other parts of the organization that didn't necessarily have that experience or that skill set to do that. So we certainly want to do more of that because um, that's really important in terms of staying connected to how people are feeling and thinking about these issues. So thank you for sharing that. So I'll, I'll begin to wrap up again. I wanted to introduce uh, this example to you here um, uh, for you to think about this work um, as you move forward. Um, and thank you for sharing uh, some of the activities that are already taking place and, and how you're thinking about this, right, at, at your institution. So I appreciate that. Um, want to again leave you with the resources that I shared. Um, I know this so this is being recorded, but I will share the slides so that um, that'll be easier for you to access them. Again, highly recommend all seven resources uh, for you to do this work. And again, want to thank you for, for participating, for being here this morning. Um, of course, if you have any other questions, I'm here. We have a few minutes left, but really thank you so much for the opportunity to come and, and work with all of you. And I wish you were in person, but I understand this is where we are today. So any final questions or thoughts or ideas? Thank you, Alexander. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Do, do any organizations have uh, any sort of uh, time set aside for people who are not uh, in minority groups to uh, be uh, enmeshed, enmeshed and emerged, immersed into a group in which they become the minority? Yeah. I, <laughs> I, 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 I see. I think when those of us who have always been in the majority group uh, find ourselves in a persistent situation where we are the only ones who look like us, we start getting a better idea of what it's like to be somebody who is not yeah. like us. But I don't yeah, know if we have time to do that immersion into 
a culture that's different from the one we were raised in, unless we were fortunate yeah. enough to be yeah. raised in a multicultural setting. Right. I think that that experience is important, right? Sometimes we need that personal connection with something to really really understand it right to really say wow you know i didn't realize that i think that's precisely one of you know one of the most important reasons why you want a diverse team around the table right uh, so that you could see and hear and engage with different colleagues right who share different perspectives ideas based on their background their experience right their world perspective and so having diversity around the table certainly helps with that you begin to see for yourself wow i didn't think of it that way and you also begin to see that it has an impact right on the outcomes right and the work that is done uh, it can take longer right because you have to diverse teams uh sometimes take longer to do the work that they have to do um, but the goal is not to do something fast but to do the best thing possible right to get it right so that's certainly important. And I think as, you know, as individuals, we can also seek out those diverse settings, right? And diverse perspectives ourselves so that we can continuously grow. I certainly try to do that myself, right? Um, participate in, and, and listen to different ideas and perspectives that maybe I'm not inclined to or experienced in, right? So I think we also have a responsibility as individuals. Are there, Thank you for putting that out there. Are there organizations that you know of, specifically uh, medical education institutions, that uh, actively invite the patients or parents of patients from uh, minority groups to come in and you know openly share their perspective on how yeah. they feel they fit into our uh, situations? Uh, yeah, so um, actually AMC is doing work in the space, right, with a lot of their community engagement efforts, right, and, and the perspective of the community, right, um, and bringing them in. So certainly um, they would have some resources and, and they would have an understanding of the landscape in terms of who's doing this uh, uh, well, or who's doing more of it, I should say. Um, but so colleagues in our equity, diversity and inclusion office, uh, possibly Dr. Malika Fair or uh, Clarence Fluker might be folks to contact because they've sort they've been working around this community engagement piece and the academic medicine community. So yeah, there's some institutions really doing that, even in terms of admissions as well, bringing in community perspectives to the admissions uh, decision making process as well. So there are a lot of really interesting models. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I think we're at time. I really enjoyed. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for the invitation. And thank you to all the colleagues who helped me with Blackboard and preparing for this session. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And I hopefully look forward to um, possibly seeing you all in person one day. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your session. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Great afternoon, everyone.